The Front Row Show does not reflect the views of Utah State, Utah State Athletics, or its affiliates. Excuse me, what the hell's going on out here? And I wish I could say something that was classy and inspirational. But that just wouldn't be our style. Stick this in your trophy case. It is that time, friends. The most wonderful time of the year. Aggie basketball is upon us, and this is the Front Row Show. What's up, Aggie fans, and welcome to a special edition basketball preview of the Front Row Show. As always, we're your hosts. I'm Matt Sonnenberg. I'm Lance Rasmussen. And I'm Jeff Browning. Follow us on Twitter at USU Front Row. Interact with us on social media. Guys, it's all about basketball this week. To start off our basketball preview, we're going to tackle five burning questions facing Utah State basketball this year. Yeah, we're getting right into it. We're not we're not No, we're not wasting around. around. There, there's no uh no small talk beforehand. Let's get right into it. I think the big question this year, will we stay healthy? I freaking hope so. I am <laughs> so sick of injuries ruining seasons for teams that I think could be the best teams in school history. I'm really ready to watch us just move through without anyone getting hurt i i mean obviously there's zero way for actually to actually predict that but guy i hope so i think we've suffered enough as a basketball fan base last year and even the year before with Brady jardine going down it, it's time the back basketball gods make things right for us and that we are able to go through a whole year without any injury problems here's here's my hope I want to see this year get played out with no player who starts the season with the intention to redshirt having not to redshirt by the end of the season. <laughs> I mean, because and a lot of people will trace that back even even back to like the 2008, 2009 seasons when we had people peter out of the program who were supposed to be here. You watch a domino effect start when you have to start pulling redshirts early. It affects things way down the road in recruiting and all of that. So. Give me a year of solidarity. Yeah. Um, and, and you know what? Health is kind of where that starts. You look at the roster, 31 games played last year by the Aggies. Only five guys played in all 31 games. Obviously, we know the big ones. Preston Medlin went down with an injury, as did Keyshawn Reed, both in that awful New Mexico State game. Uh, so and, good we're not playing and them anymore. A lot anymore. of people forget that, what, what were we, 14-1 and one going into that mm -hmm. game? Before uh, before things got really interesting, but I mean, I will say that the team, the, well, the remnants of the team that we still had were really fun to watch because I mean, for one, play their butts off. Those guys kept battling and never quit. Uh, two, a lot of them were playing injured too, and it, it kind of leaves you to wonder what else could have been if if even those remnants had been you know at a hundred percent, we might have been able to steal a handful more games and really look back on last season as. More of a success than I think it was. I, mean, I to to pull out the record we had with all with all the factors involved is pretty. Twenty two wins is nuts. Well, that was my point with last year when everyone was so down on the program and crying that Stu needed to fire everybody and redo things and just blow or the whole Stu ship needed up to get fired. Yeah, Stu needed Ugh. to get fired. Basically, you learned that your bench was the fifth place team in the WAC last year. That's what we learned. Because you never had a full team to really gauge where you were at and as a injured program. bench, too. Our, our, yeah. our hobbled, you know, banged up bench was still good. So uh, here's the thing. I, I think this year, I, I can't say for sure if we'll st stay healthy. You, you got to think that with you know more talent on this roster, less guys are going to be putting that pressure to you know, put everything on their shoulders mm -hmm. and – maybe do more than they can obviously you know play hard play leave everything out there but uh you look at last year and it was just a couple of freak things in one game that kind of doomed us and it uh you know I, I i i gotta think that there's there's just no way we could be that unlucky three years in a row right <laughs> third time's the charm this is where we finally we finally get healthy and we do it this year. There is a byproduct of so many injuries occurring last year. A lot of guys got a lot of valuable experience. Our next burning question is, how valuable is that experience going to be this year? Monumental. We've talked about it almost ad nauseum, or at least I have in my own life. But the more time kids spend within Stu's system, system 
either playing it or even just observing it, the better they are. Uh, mm -hmm. He got voted one of the best X's and O's coach in the nation this year by other coaches from all over the nation. People are aware of how good he is at coaching. The more time these kids can spend in his system, the better the team is as a whole. And we're returning a lot of guys who have had a lot of time. You, know, you look at that, and experience in Stu Morrill's system is huge. And you look down the roster, all the guys combined, the amount of years of experience they have in this system, whether it's as red shirts or playing, you know, you get a feel for it running in practice, even if you're red shirting. But 19 years worth on this roster of guys that have played tons of returners. Between how many guys? Let's, let's address let's, that real Let's quick. count up. So we got Marcel Davis, Ben Clifford, Jared Shaw, Danny Berger, Preston Medlin, Tanael Rowland, Spencer Butterfield, Jordan Stone, and Sean Harris. That, in and of itself, would be a starting nine that I would be. I mean, if you had that as your nine-man rotation for the rest of the year, I'm happy with that. Which, here, I mean, here's the thing. You know, you got to wonder, are we going to finally have that deep nine- to ten-man rotation that we, we've kind of always longed for? We thought we might, you know, eventually have We thought we might have it last year with all these uh, guys coming in until everyone got hurt. And then, you know, things things got pretty interesting from there. But, I mean, you look at it now, it's not that we have, you know, a lot of newcomers coming in that we think are going to contribute. We have guys returning that we've seen contribute and that we've seen good things out of. And I think with that, uh, to go with all the trials they ran into last year between taking their, their lumps and growing pains and learning things on the fly and dealing with injuries and having to be called up to bigger roles well, I think and playing in close games and winning some of them. And I think the Danny Berger experience deserves its own shout out. Like yeah. outside, outside of the injuries that happened in games, that experience in and of itself, I think deserve like the fact that the team was able to rally around that and continue forward deserves a special recognition. Here's the thing. So if it was after five games last year that that happened, I mean, we we told the story. That was a that was a really rough day on the front row show. I remember we we were all over the place emotionally and not sure what was going to happen and and all this. But uh, the, you know, things were really bad for them there. They had to overcome that and keep playing basketball. And then they got dealt a handful more trials. You know, you mm -hmm. go thinking, all right, well that's the worst of it. And then you know, some more bad stuff comes along. You lose more guys for the season. It it it's gonna just kind of create an edge. A, just a grit among guys that I think this team is going to have. I think the whole experience brought everyone closer mm -hmm. last year. And, and I'll be honest, having, you know, seen a handful of these guys around, they're a close knit team, which is, I, th I think something that was kind of missing in 2012 and 2013, but something we had in a big way with the likes of Ty Wesley, Tyler Newbold, Brady Jardine, Pooh Williams, Pooh Williams, you know, all these guys that were, you know, Great players on the court, worked well as a team, but also friends off the court. And I think that matters. It matters a lot, and this team's got it. The next burning question isn't concerned with the players on the court. It's about the environment. Will Is this the year the spectrum returns to glory? Let me put it this way. I think this is the greatest home schedule that the spectrum will have ever seen. Yeah. I don't know if you can ever, even just the out of conference schedule for the home schedule is going to be seeing the cali caliber of teams that we've really never seen there before. Yes, there will be a couple division two schools, a couple people that we, you know, will anticipate wins. There's always what I think to be some of my favorite games of the year, honestly, in the Gosner classic or whatever they're, they're calling it these days. Yes. You know, low, low caliber opponents, but we're seeing, large conference schools coming to the spectrum this year. Pac-12, SEC school. We're, yeah. yeah. We're, and we're having potentially what I have to imagine by the time conference play rolls around, we could be seeing two, three, maybe four top 25 teams on our home court every this, mm -hmm. this season. If there is a year that it should happen, it's this year. If there's a year it could happen, it's this year. And if there's a year it better happen, it's this year. Because we're going to need every ounce of help that we can get. You know, to, back to the original question of will it return to glory. I was talking to a good friend of mine the other day who we used to always rock the front row together all the time. And he said, if not this year, maybe never. Because, I mean, like you said, this schedule is incredible. If people weren't turning out the last couple of years because – you know, the, the opponents weren't that great. I don't buy that because back in the day, back in the Big West, back in the WAC, it didn't matter. You know, we had we had teams competing for conference titles and we packed the building 
every game, yes. no matter what. It didn't it didn't matter who. It didn't matter if we were going to beat them by 40 because we were going to stay for the up by 40 chat. And if we got up by 50, we'd start cheering for the other team. It's fun. It's the most fun you can have in Logan. And there's there's just nothing better than going out and going nuts for your team. How or why that has been missing, I do not know. But, I mean, I tell you what, the team is experienced. They're deep. They're going to win most, if not all, of these home games. And it's – it's gonna be it's gonna be an uphill battle, maybe more so than ever. But man, talk about if we were to go crazy as it sounds to talk about that it's a stretch to expect. But if we were to go undefeated at home this year, that would be monumental. That would almost like if you really consider it, depending on how other teams do. But that could almost shoe us into the top twenty-five if we are undefeated at home and don't and have a mixed road game schedule. But if we can win all of our home games this year, that puts us among the elite in the nation. Yeah. He- Here's the thing. There is a responsibility that rests on the shoulders of a few of us who have some influence to make that building what it is. Because, Lance, you said this a couple weeks ago, that our student section is fabled across the country. This year, the TV cameras are going to be in the spectrum. They're going to see what Utah State students are truly made of. And if there is an energy and drive from the leaders of the herd, from those of us here on the Front Row Show, then... It's not going to work because, sadly enough, this is true. You walk around campus and you ask just a common student about the basketball team, the answer, and I've done this, is, eh, they're all right. They're not that good. People actually believe that. And I don't know where that has gotten lost in our mindset that we do not have a good basketball team, but there has been a serious lack of energy in the spectrum, and that has got to change, and it comes from not allowing this idea of our basketball team being, eh, okay. No, 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 The basketball team is great. you got to come out because you can make a difference. That idea has got to permeate all of Logan. And we, we are aware of our demographic on this show. Most of the people who are going to be listening to this broadcast are already in the spectrum or have plans to be there. You know, it's it's... We're not picking up people who are not sports fans who are going, oh, I would like to listen to the Front Row Show and have them talk about Aggie Athletics. Although they should. But... And I, I don't I'm, I'm going to share this story not to not to try to toot my own horn in any way or shape or form. I, I, I've told you before, I'm a theater major. I'm an acting major. The art of sports is not something that is widely celebrated within my department. Within the past year, I have had nine different theater students at games with me. And all nine of them have asked to come back to a game at some point. It has got to the point, Good. actually, we uh, and this is my shout out to one of our new professors, Jason Spellbring. Attending a football or basketball game is going to be mandatory for his students in beginning acting classes from this point to the end of his time teaching well at done, Utah beautiful. State University. Well done, Because sir. of the emotion and effort that is put there. And that was just from him seeing one football game last week. Okay? The people who are listening now have a responsibility because you know what the spectrum can be. Yeah. You don't know what your influence can be. It's about talking about it to your friends, getting them psyched, and... Force them to go to a game. Say, come with me to this. Just one or two of you. I know you're interested. Or come check out the atmosphere. If everyone who listened to this podcast in a week, or even half of the people who listened to this podcast in a week, brought one friend to a game, uh, you would, we would we would see a packed and the cheers over are easy. The other spectrum. thing I really want. There's so many people at the who have been to football games in the last little while and thought the atmosphere is there has been great with the herd. The football atmosphere is great because it's loud, but if you want the ability to really influence things and have fun with a crowd, you got to make it to the spectrum. We, speaking with that influence, you know, you mentioned that there's there's that attitude among students where you you ask them about the basketball team, you're like, eh, they're okay. You know, there was there was some years there where yeah, the basketball team was just okay, but that crowd at games, and it's it's not just you know in the two thousands and the. 2010, 2011, it's, from what I've heard, the dominance of the spectrum goes back generations. Yep. It, may have had, it may have had its rises and its lower points, but I'll tell you what, that crowd, when it gets going and it is rocking at its best, can turn a good team great. And they can turn an, OTA, an OK team very good. And we've been missing that the last two years. We've seen little, little glimpses here and there. But it has been lacking. And I think that attitude of, oh, they're okay, needs to change to, we're not going to lose here. Never. 
We get, everyone's got to take it upon themselves because it's it's not just the basketball team. It's your university, and you got to come yeah. out and go crazy for that team and make an actual impact because you can do it more there than anywhere. And let me make you this promise. We at the Front Row Show are more than just some talking heads sitting here. We're not <laughs> going to be sitting back asking everyone else to go do this. We're going to be doing everything that we possibly can to get people to the games and organized and ready to go. This season is going to be something special be because of what the fans are going to be able to put together. And I think that we're going to see a return to the glory of the 2008, 2009, 2010 days in many more ways than one. So we're right there with you. And pay attention to what's going to be coming up because I think it's going to be, I think we have a chance to make things epic this year. You're getting me excited, Lance. Oh, Can you say anything more? No, I can't. Okay. We'll but have to talk later. But let the, uh, let the theorizing begin. All right. I like it. I like it. Our fourth burning question is, what's going on at the four position? Oh, man. Well, this is uh, this has kind of been a, a bit of a hot topic all off season. I, I, I've said since the beginning, since a lot of people were saying, man, if we go into next year with Ben Clifford starting at power forward, we're in big trouble. And there has it, been a lot of hate for our fours. It brings, brings me back to a, a time when people were saying, Man, if Nate Bendall is starting at center, yep. we're in big trouble. And all he did was lead USU to, what, a 27-3 and record in WAC play over that span and two NCAA tournament appearances and on, just his on while bad he was feet. here. Uh, yeah, on bad feet. He's one of you know seven Aggies ever to go to play in three NCAA tournaments. No big deal. But uh, Ben Clifford's numbers last year were pretty good as, as a starter. As a starter, after he had... A, a bigger burden placed on his shoulders, you know, something like 8.9 points and 5.3 rebounds per game, I believe it was, over those final 15 as a starter. Now, here's the problem. Ben Clifford's hurt. <laughs> so yeah. this position gets that much more tricky. And if I can bring up a quick, quick point with Clifford, at least, he's not going to be Keyshawn Reed. And I think that no. was one of the huge detrimental things to him playing ball that everyone was going. We had probably one of the greatest highlight clip showtime athletes that we've ever had on the basketball field get injured. Yeah, he was that. And in comes a gritty, throw my body on the court white guy <laughs> who isn't dunking the ball down the court every second and just blowing people's minds with athleticism. And I think a lot of people counted that against him, despite the fact he was able to produce. Well, here's the thing. Keyshawn Reed was a tremendous athlete, a highlight reel athlete, and I'm not dissing him at all or disparaging him. He was a great blocker, but other than that, his offensive game was pretty limited. He never had a consistent jump shot or anything like that that teams really had to fear. Ben Clifford, towards the end of last year, was developing that outside shot, not only from the 15-foot range, but from the three-point range. Oh, man, there was his, a... his game, to me is not as much of a highlight as Keyshawn's, but it actually, to me, is a better overall game. He's not the athlete, but as terms of a complete basketball player, I think he's better. I, I think it's a difficult thing to compare the two because he, he, he does not bring a lot of the defensive capabilities necessary that the Keyshawn brought. Keyshawn but was great at the weak side I, block. I, you know, I understand that. And and I, I don't know if I would necessarily say better, but I can fully agree that he has a skill set that will be able to accomplish what is needed for this team. So, I'll, I'll say this much. Look at Ben Clifford's – go go to ESPN.com and look at, look at his game log for the later part of that season, uh, especially you know the final five games or so, mainly the last three. Uh, you can't tell me that that's overly discouraging. I mean, especially in the last game of the year in the WAC tournament, he hit four or five three-pointers. I mean, ben Clifford kept us entirely alive in that game. He had 16 points. He's done well at rebounding his whole career. He's gritty. He's a fighter. And he was only a sophomore last year, people got to remember. We're talking a lot about Ben Clifford, but like we said, he's injured. He's not going to be playing for the first little bit. So let's talk about the guys who will be in charge of plugging that in. Kyle Davis, Sean Harris, Jordan Stone will probably see some time at the four position. Yep. What are those guys going to be able to do to make that position a effective position? Well, uh... <laughs> They got to make a quick adjustment in the Stu system, and I think that gives maybe a little bit of an edge to Sean Harris. But at the same time, you got to got to remember Kyle Davis 
is a guy that flew under the radar recruiting wise because he moved high schools between his junior and senior year, mm -hmm. moved to the state of Utah and was the 5A player of the year at Alta High School and route to a state championship with them. Well, you know, by then, uh, the recruiting high, uh, the recruiting scene had died down quite a bit, ends up at Southern Utah later in that season is essentially you know, one of their best players, if not their best player. Yep. And uh, you know, goes on a mission and decides he wants to be a part of USU's program. So this is a good player we're getting. It's going to be a step up for him as far as competition goes. And it is also going to be, you know, it's always tough for those guys coming off missions. Well, well we I, I know this will probably ruffle a few feathers, but I still trust Stu's eye when it comes to recruiting. There are not a whole, I mean, he has not missed very often in his tenure at Utah State. Yeah, there's a lot of people who argue with you on that. There's a lot of people who would argue with me on that. But I mean, you look. As far as recruiting Utah recruits, kids out of the state, and especially return missionaries, give me an example who hasn't rolled out and been effective in the program in some way. No, no, no that's true. I, I mean, JC transfers are a different story. Kids from out of state are a different story. But when it comes to sticking with a thing that really has carried his program over the, probably the second half of it, I don't think there's you could really give me an RM that he's recru recruited that hasn't turned out in some way. I'll, I'll say this. We have seen... I'd say even a staggering amount of junior college recruits kind of flame out and not cut it here. But to your point, with the guys that go on missions or the return missionaries and also the high school, the high school recruits that stick it out past year one, how many have flopped? You know, granted, there's been a handful that left after one year, but really, or, you know, after two weeks, how many? <laughs> right. But how many of them that stuck it out for a full season and came back for a second one? Did you watch them play as a sophomore and think, eh, not very good. Still, still not where I want. Like, yeah. like yeah. there a lot of people were frustrated with Jackson Meyer back in the day, but you the dude was a leader. I mean, his teams won. And even in I think what his last game is an Aggie or one of his last games is an Aggie in the WAC tournament. Stepped up for like nine first half points in a big game against Louisiana Tech in the WAC tournament. Dude, uh, dude had some game to him, and I, I think was a, a great person to have a part of the program. And I always said, this team hurt in 2012 without Jackson Meyer. So, really, even he was a, a great addition to the program because he was one of those guys that stuck it out and committed to things. And you get that with return missionaries, and you get that with the high school recruits. And I, I think that is, that speaks to Stu's eye for recruiting. I think what a lot of people are seeing at the four position is the four has always been a glamorous spot. It's always been a focal point of the Stu Moore offense. You look at Sean Daniels way back in the day, Desmond Pinnegar when he was here, and then you moved into Nate Harris and then Ty Wesley. So the four has always been something. Don't forget Steve Ducharme. <laughs> Love Steve Ducharme. Actually, he was kind he was of a more of a, he was kind more of a five. Buddy. But Chaz force. Spicer yeah, should have been should have been that, playing that, that three. That <laughs> but here's the thing. And so when people look at the Kyle Davis and you know the Sean Harris, they go, "Well, they're not Ty. They're not Sean. They're not Desmond. We're in trouble." You have your scoring option down in the post with Jared Shaw at the five, and he's yep. a, he's a stretch five. He can shoot that jump shot. You need these guys to be the rebounders, the bangers, the hustlers of the group. And you look at all of those great power force they always had the opposite of that on the on the five you bring up ty wesley he had nate bendel uh, on the five opposite of that so you need a banger down low to go with him and that's all these guys really need to be i think and w i think one of the pros about this is you look at the bodies we're bringing at least with sean harris and especially with jordan stone if they don't score a point in the game but just are there to grab rebounds and get in people's way and make it difficult for them, I think we're going to be in good shape. Here's the main thing that I that I want to see out of the power forward position this year. Like you said, not going to be a lot of scoring. Ben Clifford can do it a little bit. We saw it last year, and I think with a lot of pressure taken off of him, he'll have some great opportunities to maybe shoot some deep balls and kind of be a secret weapon. But the main thing is we need our power forwards to be rebounding machines. That is all we need because Jared Shaw can score in the post. He can also score that mid-range jumper. We need the power forward crashing the boards, trying to get us second opportunities and offensive rebounds. And the same goes for a scenario where we're letting the guards shoot it because the guards are going to shoot it a lot this year. And Jared Shaw will still grab his fair amount of rebounds. We need the power forwards to do that now. The last burning question on our list. We jumped to, at the time, the number one rated RPI conference last year. How do we do in the Mountain West? I, I think, given all these factors that we've just discussed, I think we compete fairly well. I think we might even, I think we've got plenty of potential to surprise a lot of people. 
Look, it's a very good basketball conference, but it's not perfect. I mean, yeah. it's not like every team we're going to be facing is perfectly coached or, and just loaded with five-star talent. That's been my point. We, we've seen teams packing four- and five-star talent that we've just manhandled in the past. I mean, look Nevada. at— Look at Nevada. Look at, you know, New Mexico State for a few years had a few big time guys that, you know, they gave us fits some games. We'd lose on the road there, but then other games we would they'd come to our house and we'd smack them around. Stu's got, Stu knows how to maximize talent. Not only that, he's going against a whole lot of teams that aren't familiar of how to coach against him. And I think, you know, we're going to see a lot of battle tested aspects of this team early in the year with the tough non conference schedule we have. I think we're going to have some challenges that are going to prepare us for conference play. And, and one thing that we've seen over the years is, you know, in these games that we've had, uh, you know, a lot of times it's our NCAA tournament game. We had the game against Georgetown a few years back. It, it's a struggle for our guys early on to get acclimated and really get things going. But as the game goes on, they get it going. They start making shots. They realize, you know, how they're going to score on those tough defensive teams. And I think we're going to see that in a big way where, you know, maybe some games will struggle early on, but I think once this team really gets a feel for the competition, they're going to be able to compete at a high level. And I think that's the way that actually, in my prediction, the season's going to ro roll out, is that you're going to watch this team. They might get off to a bit of a slow start, which, if I may point out, can be uh, aided by the fact that we have so many home games to start off our out-of-conference, <laughs> so that by the time we get to our conference schedule... That transition is not going to be that difficult. And even if we do start out conference play a little rough, by the end of the season, things we could be making a whole lot of noise. Because time after time, Stu has proven that with experience and time, I mean, case in point is last year, Simbular versus Jared Shaw. You know, game one was a nightmare. Game two was the opposite kind of nightmare, yep. you know, and it was just a coaching effort saying this is what you need to do in order to be able to change this around. I wholeheartedly believe that Stu is going to be able to rally around. We're going to be seeing four and five star recruits on a couple teams, but there's going to be one or two of them, maybe three. And we've proven in years past that we can stop that as a team. Uh, one, one quick note. One of, the, one of the biggest rising stars in the NBA right now. You could probably think who it might be. Paul George. Paul George. Look at what he did against USU back in the day. He was largely ineffective. He put up some points here and there, but he wasn't a good team player. I, I feel a lot of people have this idea that in the Mountain West, we're just going to have vastly superior athletes running circles around our players. No, we're, we've got some good basketball players on this team. You're not playing. That are smart, know how to play as a team, and can work to shut guys like this down. I mean, Tyler Newbold locked down Paul George yeah and, and a lot of people look at Tyler Newbold and think well slow unathletic skinny white guy but you know Paul George would probably beg to differ Here, here's the thing you're not playing NBA teams every night which I kind of feel is the way people are perceiving the Mountain West is this immense elite group of athletes that like you said is just gonna kill us that's not true at all there are some elite athletes some highly touted recruits I'm not disparaging that but to emphasize your point even more, look at Luke Babbitt. He was the number two player in the country when he went to Nevada. I mean, he originally committed to Ohio State, came to Nevada, and Ty Wesley just abused him like he beat some, like he stole something, you know? Yeah. So you can't just look at the five-star rating and say, well, automatically, that means we're in trouble. That's not the case at all. I think the key to winning in the Mountain West for Utah State is to protect the home court. If you can win pretty much all your games, maybe lose a game here or there, but still have a vastly superior home court record, you're going to be just fine. Because there's going to be nights on the road where, yeah, you probably don't have it and the other team is just hot. But if you protect your home court, that's the key to kind of remaining in that upper part of the Mountain West, which will make it much easier in the NCAA tournament to getting a better seed. Well, speaking of the NCAA tournament, how many NCAA tournaments have we lost by 10 or more points? And during Stu's tenure. Texas A&M. Texas A&M. Uh, are we talking opening round games? I'm struggling to think of another. Right, think of another besides Texas A&M. How many of those times have we been seated six seats Maybe or lower? Maybe Washington. Maybe Washington? I think yeah. Washington got us by 12. What about 13. Arizona? I think Arizona was closer than that. Were they? Mm. How many of those teams were seated six seeds or higher than us in the tournament? Every one of them. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, wait, no, Marquette. Marquette was Marquette six. Marquette was a six. And we were 11. So, and we were 11. Okay. Yep. So that's six seeds or higher. I would make the submission that in every single one of those games, we were going up against teams that were vastly, to put it in layman's terms, more athletic and highly more highly recruited than what we had. We have not come out pulling in any one of those games yet, but we have proven, at least in my mind, that we are able to keep through the system that is run at this university, we are able to compete with athletes regardless of what they are able to produce or put out. And rather than be in a scenario where we've got, you know, one game against this team and and it's do or die. On a what, foreign what, court. May, yeah. maybe, maybe we lose a tough one early in conference play to a really good team that's super athletic. But maybe we learn to adjust from that and we get mm-hmm. better. Because Stu Morrill does that. He's still a very, very good coach. Like we said earlier, one of the best X's and O's guys in the country. He still is. I, I, I feel like people are down on Stu a little bit lately, but... I think this year we are going to see maybe just how good he is. And I, I don't think any of us are in any way saying we're going to be able to go in and win the Mountain West Conference oh, no, no, in no, basketball no, no, no. year one. But as we've said before, I mean, yes, there was a lot of talk towards the end of the last year about how the RPI numbers were a bit skewed in the Mountain West favor. And goodness knows they didn't really perform in the NCAA tournament last year. Yeah, But they still got five teams in. And even if we can finish in the top four or five teams in this conference and make some noise, especially late in the year, we could see single-digit seedings for the first time in school history. And I've been saying it for five, six years. As soon as Stu gets handed the chance where he's actually favored in an NCAA tournament game, you're going to watch him make more than one victory work. If I'm har- excited. If Harvard can beat UNLV, we can too. Or New Mexico. Who's New Mexico? That they beat. Harvard, yep. Yep. In the so, first round. Yeah. That was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> if they can do it, we can too. Yep. Those are our five burning questions for USU basketball. Fans, if you disagree with us or you agree with us, let us know. What are your five burning questions? We're now going to go into position by position and kind of break it down. And to start off. I'm excited for yes, this. To start off, let's go with the point guards. Oh, and yeah. My boy, my, uh, my deity, Marcel <laughs> Davis. I. I am wickedly excited for him as a sophomore. When you consider last year, he ran this team on two very bad ankles and what he was still able to produce. And mind you, everyone else around him was also injured. You got to like just a pure point guard, if ever there is one. And I will still stand by my prediction that Marcel Davis, by the time he's done, could be the best pure point guard in Utah State history. The kid has that much ability, and I'm excited to see what he brings this year. Yeah, I think everybody knows that year two, year one to year two is kind of the biggest jump that guys make in Stu's system. We've seen it countless times. I mean, you look at back to that 2009 team that is, in my opinion, you know, the best of at least the last 10 years. It was almost made up entirely of guys in year two in the system or year, year two as a player. Ty Wesley, Tyler Newbold, Pooh po- Williams, Gary Wilkinson. I mean, that Jared is Quayle, yeah. that's the the core. That, well, Quayle was in his first year at was, that point. Was, oh yeah, he wasn't. He came. He, he came right after J C Carroll. But I mean, we had all all these people wondering how are we going to replace J C Carroll, the all time leader in school hist- or scoring leader in school history, Chris Clark, who set the single season assist record, Steve Ducharme, who was a good starter one year and great off the bench the next. Uh, how are we going to place those guys from a WAC championship team and Second year in the program, guys, was how we did it. And we did it with in dominating fashion that season. How it, many second year guys do we have this this time? A lot, but I will say uh, with our point guards, you have two of them in Marcel Davis yeah, and no, T.L. Rollins. And, and to me, while Matt's counting that up, I for Marcel, if he can improve that outside shot and make defenses respect that outside shot, he's going to be deadly because he's lightning quick inside the paint and – he can either lay it up or just dish it off to someone like Shaw for a slam. Yeah, I mean, here's the thing. We've got four guys that are that are going to be going into their second year of playing for the Aggies with Davis, Jared Shaw, Spencer Butterfield, and Tanael Roland. But those are all crucial guys mm-hmm. right there. I mean, these are all guys that showed a very, very bright flashes last year. Well, and speaking of bright flashes and Marcel Davis, he had some passes last year. Oh, sick. 
that I just like there was a couple times where I watched him just cutting underneath the hoop going where is he and all of a sudden his arms around a guy giving an assist that I no one could see it coming and if he is able to keep that kind of court vision I mean and it, it has it, always it, been the case it's not that he's going to keep it he's going to improve on improve it, it. Yeah. yeah well I it has always been the case within Stu's system. If you have a point guard who can dish out assists, yep. and I have quoted this stat online multiple times to litter of little avail and anyone actually paying attention to me, but if Stu's teams can get more than 14 assists in a game, we don't lose. It's, it is statistically, I think we win something like 84% of our games uh, if we are above 15 assists in a game. Yeah, uh, and, and here's here's the nice thing about... You know, if Davis is only playing, say, 25 minutes a night or so, the guy backing him up, we talked about guys having strong finishes. Taneo Rowland, over the last six games of last season, scored in double digits five of those six times. And the one game he didn't, he had nine points. He started it's hitting nice the three ball. He, he was making shots from all, from all over the place, really. Uh, just seemed to – it finally clicked for him as to – you know, what he needed to do to be effective in this system. He's obviously had an, a whole offseason to get better, and I think this is as steady and solid as the point guard position maybe has been since, you know, the days of Bernard Rock or maybe Mark Brown. Oh, I love Mark Brown. Thank you for bringing him up. Let's, uh, let's talk about the shooting guards, and this is where you have kind of the meat of your offensive production Preston Medellin, back from that wrist injury, is going to be great. And then a revelation in Spencer Butterfield as well. Yeah. I I think in this scenario, we're not just so much talking about two shooting guards because I don't think it's going to be one or the other very much this year with these guys. I think I think going into the year, both of these guys will be starting. I, I You know, a lot of people think, well, you can't have a six-foot-three small forward in Spencer Butterfield. Why not? It worked fine last year because he lit it up well, for it, the bulk of the season. And, you know, is, is anybody going to out-tough him on the court? Well, and here's the thing. A couple years ago when we played Marquette, they they ran the same system of, like, kind of that three guard. Yeah. And their small forward was 6'3", six, 6'4", six, and they were great. I mean, you can run a system where you have – smaller players and still be ex- extremely effective. Right. So one of the grittiest Aggie teams ever, the 2007 team that beat number ninth ranked Nevada. I mean, we want to talk about powerhouse teams in a conference. That was, I mean, that not, that Nevada team was better than any team we'll play in the Mountain West this year. They had four NBA and, players on and there? And yeah. who, who was the starting small forward for USU that year? Six foot three, Doral Peterson. <laughs> he wasn't even six three. That was a gracious six three. Spencer's got some height and bulk on Peterson. I am so excited to watch teams try to defensively scheme against having them both of them on the court at the same time. Like, what do you do? I mean, you have one of them sending on uh, on each side of the court. Who do you double team? Marcel Who do you plan Davis on waiting to blow past people yeah. or dish it off to Jared Shaw. Yeah. Ben Clifford hanging out behind three when nobody's thinking he's going to kill you, but he will. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, really, when you look at the shooting guard, it's a pick your poison, pick your assassin type of situation. With, with either of those, because they're kind of interchangeable, the two and the three, really. Well, and, and I would also like to point out the fact that we have had a lot of very... Last year, especially towards the end of the year, one of the big issues that a lot of people are pointing out was just a lack of dynamic leadership on the team. And Butterfield was kind of the one who really kind of st- stood up and really was able to be that vocal leader. But both of these guys... I mean, that was one of the reasons everyone liked, loved Ty Wesley so much. And loved, as you go back to J.C. Carroll to a degree, but... Gary Wilkinson. Gary Wilkinson. The, there were the, guys the who leader. allowed themselves to feel the game. And Medlin is one of those guys. Butterfield's another one. And, God, it's it's one of... I feel off it, and I hope the Spectrum's going to be able to pick up with it this year. But if those two can keep that emotion yep. ev- involved in their game... Things are going to get dangerous. And, and there's another player in the shooting guard position, JoJo McLaughlin. My guess is he'll redshirt, but the kid is an athletic talent that Spectrum fans will come to love in later years. Let's talk about the small forward position. It really kind of is interchangeable with the two, and we talked about Spencer Butterfield and Preston Medlin being on the court at the same time. But you look at the three. You have Butterfield, and then you have Danny Berger, who everyone just loves for obvious reasons, plus he's a good player. 
Yeah. And then I, you have perhaps the most highly talented freshman coming in in Jalen Moore that Utah State has had in a long time. Yeah, you know, we we worried about – people were worried about size a little bit. But when you get into the other half of that small forward and really the wings, you've got some size in Berger and Moore. Uh, both run about six seven, mm. uh, or can get rebounds, can do a lot of things. I mean, Danny Berger a couple of years ago when he was healthy – I believe led the team in assist to turnover ratio. He was kind of that uh, that anchor on the offense to really get things going over on the wings. Uh, if he can consistently hit outside shots, he is going to be a scoring threat. Uh, and then Jalen Moore, oh. it, it, it's, oh. it's pretty exciting to think about what we could be seeing here. Obviously, I, I hate to pat a kid too much on the back before he's even stepped on the court in an Aggie uniform. Uh, because you know potential is nothing until it's turned into production. But uh, I think this kid is going to work for it. I think he's going to put in the time. He's going to put in the work to do what he has to do to become the player that we think he can be. I mean, he, this is a kid basically born of the Aggie program. His dad played here. He's employed by the university. He's a Hall of and, Fame player at this point. Yeah. I mean, just uh, – they're, they're, look, I, I just think there's a, no doubt that – Jalen's dad and Stu have a relationship, and Stu's probably made it very clear that there's going to have to be a lot of hard work put in by oh, put yeah. in by your kid to earn what he's got to earn here, and nobody's going to be pushing him to work harder than good old dad. And uh, I, I think it's going to be something special at this position. I think we're going to see plenty of them on the court this year, but uh, really, this whole this position as a whole is encouraging. That. Jalen Moore is kind of our fourth man in, you know. Well, and here's the thing: you look. If Butterfield is a starting three, which we kind of all think he will be to start off the year, and you bring guys like Berger and Moore off the bench, I'm sorry, but I don't see many teams that we'll be facing that can bring players of those caliber off the bench. And that second unit is going to be vital to the success of this team. Well, and it's also going to be fun for us when we go, oh, we've got, we're have got we going up against a, a taller shooting guard or some, you know, a taller uh. three or four. Hey, big lineup gets to go in now. Let's go, let's go stick things in defense-wise. Oh, they're out. We're going to run the court and hit you from outside. I, it, one of my personal favorite things, and it goes back to what we were talking a little bit about before with Berger, he came out as a highly touted recruit. His coach in, in high school was astonished he, uh, he committed to Utah State because he said he could have gone to bigger programs. But it's another one of those return missionary guys who Stu has gone out for the work ethic he has. I think we're going to see bigger things out of Berger this year than we have at any point in the past. One other quick note about the whole big lineup aspect of things. Let's not forget that once upon a time when the coaches were wondering who's going to play point guard for this team, one guy they were looking toward was Preston Medlin. Mm -hmm. And we, they, we could still see at times. I think it'll be sparse given the depth we have. But we could see a lineup of maybe Medlin, Berger, Moore going 6'4", 6'7", 6'7", from the 1 through 3. Not out of the question. I mean, I, I remember once a few years ago, Tim Durier called Preston Medlin the best passing two guard we've ever had at Utah State. The guy Ooh. knows how to dish the ball. So, I mean, you can take the best passing two guard, and it'll probably be a pretty effective point guard in that instance. But I, I'm really encouraged both with the talent, the potential, and the experience and depth of these wings now. They're going to be absolutely crucial. And as has brought, been brought up before, we can remember a day not so long ago where the hot, tallest starter we had on our team was about a generous 6'7", six, 6'8". So uh, six six seven six seven a, a Chaz Spicer six seven you know and <laughs> we're bringing some athletes and some size to the table that I think should be really exciting even just on that low spectrum without touching what I assume we'll be covering next which is the four position. Indeed, we are. We've I mean, already, even though we've kind of already touched, we've a already lot touched of them. on them, but let's touch on them again, even just briefly. Ben Clifford. I I really do think is poised for a breakout year once he gets back from his injury because I think. He's a hard worker, and I think that's an undervalued skill is to, is to be a hard worker. And when you have that hard work and that dedication, it's going to pay off. I really believe he's going to be big. And then Kyle Davis and Sean Harris, if they're nothing more than just bangers for this team and rebound machines, that's good enough. And I would like to say, yeah, we've never seen Sean Harris play. And yes, he's a couple years removed from really having been playing a lot of competitive ball, but there's just some things that come naturally to a guy. And if he can step back into the role and do the things that he did way back when he was still playing ball, 
even come close to it of, of a lot of the things that we have been told about the way he output in junior college, especially back in his high school days. We could be looking at someone who was at least, at least going to be able to come in and be a contributor. I'll say this about the four position. You mentioned Ben Clifford's hustle and that, that motor that he has that has kind of made his whole career up to this point. Uh, another quick note on him, great free throw shooter. Yes, I think very he's great free possibly throw the best free throw shooting big man we've had here. And I think uh, Davis and Harris I mean, are both He's up there with Gary Wilkinson. Well. But uh, I'll say this. I get the sense that this team has an attitude about them where they're all aware of the success Utah State basketball had before they got here. And they've seen harder times than any of those WAC championship dynasty teams <laughs> saw. But they know that they're capable of playing at a high level. And I think they're holding themselves too. I think that toughness on the team, you know, it's going to come from guys like Preston Medlin, who was battle tested through the good times and the bad. Uh, Spencer Butterfield, who came in and just is the epitome of grit. Ben Clifford, who started seeing the court right after the, those glory years of 2009 to 2011 ended and was a red shirt on that 2011 team. These guys have seen the good and they've seen the bad, but they've, they've tasted the good. And I think the attitude of the team is better. And then, then you throw in Brian Green on the coaching staff. That's a and, great addition, uh, by the way. And I, I think this team is going to take it personal to do everything they can. Now, granted, the power forward position might not be loaded with ability, but it ain't bad. Especially once Clifford's back, you've got three guys that are going to play hard. They're going to battle it out. And whoever ends up seeing the floor the most, they're going to have earned it. Let's move to the five position and returning one of the most productive players from last year's team, probably the most productive, Jared Shaw anchors the front court. And in terms of talent, I still don't think we've seen a guy with his height and his ability to hit that jump shot like him ever. I mean, he is very, very talented individual. The question is toughness, especially in a league like the Mountain West when you're going to get banged a lot. You're going to get pushed around every night, and he is going to have to provide a physicalness down low for this team. Yeah, I think this is something that we saw him get better at as last year went on because, you know, it, it seemed like you know, Shaw, he, he wanted to be a finesse big man early on last year, and he was good at it. He would hit that mid-range jumper. He's tall enough that he can get it off against most people, and he got his fair share of rebounds. But it seemed like as the year went on, he started realizing that he needed to be tougher down low to really bang bodies with the big boys. Well, and I, I just am so excited with uh, that we don't need Shaw to come in and really be that necessarily that power guy anymore because we've got a lot of other bodies on the court that will be able to do it i mean our four position is looking like it's going to have some guys who are going to be able to body up and not only that but he is growing and guy and i i know jeff has brought it up before but if someone could teach him the ty wesley just quick back step on defense you know he started trying it last year yeah he started trying it and to one point i disagree with you a little i think we do need shaw to be the kind of the bruiser down low because someone's got to be our power forwards are unproven. We think they could be, you know, decent kind of finesse forwards. Ben Clifford likes to try and get down there, but he doesn't really have much of a back to the basket game, whereas Shaw does to a point, and he tried getting better at it as last year went on. And if he can be that down low, just push guys around presence, this team's offense is going to have some serious balance. Point to taken. It. Point taken. Well said. I think the other person you need to bring up in the center position, someone who will probably see some at the four, is Jordan Stone. And what, what a, a man. massive person. Oh yeah. Goodness. Yeah, it, I was I ran into him at Charlie's the other day and not like I went out of my way to make myself noticed. Sure. But I stood next to him at Charlie's the other day. I'm six five. Like I'm not a short guy. I felt dwarfed in every sense of the now I'm you know six five hundred and sixty five pounds so let's let's preface that a bit but he's literally twice me it's crazy yeah uh, he we you know I think the hype on Stone a lot of it began I think it was his first year back he might have been redshirting but there was a picture that came out of him playing pickup ball and it, it was a shirts versus skins thing and he was just jacked. I mean, absolutely ripped, and it's not like he got weaker in that time span. He's big, he's strong, 
but he's also unrefined. And that's kind of been the hang up of his career so far, but he has been good defensively, which is what, you know, in a lot of ways we need him to be. We're going to have scoring coming from all the one through three positions. We might have some from the four. And when Shaw's out of the game, if he can just lock down that paint and make sure the other guy ain't scoring down there, Jordan Stone will have done his job just fine. But even, I mean, even still you look, he had 2.6 points per game last season, shot 47 and a half percent from the field. The free throws were not good, uh, and he had 2.7 rebounds per game. So there, there's room to go up, but you know we knew he was a project coming in, and it's going to be interesting to see what steps forward he's taken. And once again, he's in there primarily for the insane amount of physicality he can bring to the court. It, you know, if it's, Sim it's, Bular can't move him, no one can move him. Yeah, right. right. I mean, you you look, he, he was dwarfed by Bular, and he was able to push him around every step. It's I'm really excited to see what another year worth of experience and responsibility really has been able to do for him within the system. With, with the guys kind of knocked out that we've talked about, we, you know, there's still a few more pieces of this team that are worth mentioning that we're not totally sure we'll actually see a lot of the floor this year, but let's run them down. I think maybe the, the leader in the clubhouse of guys that could see time this year, given the injury situation down low is Carson Shanks. And this is uh this is that big seven footer that I think uh, we everybody's been waiting. We've seen a lot of guys that we thought were seven feet tall and then showed up and were six six ten six eleven, he, uh, or were named Anthony DiLoretto. He, he is listed on the prospectus at seven feet tall, so that's official. Yeah, that's but, after the two inches worth of strength. This, this is a guy that committed to USU you know, quite really a while early, back yeah. now mm -hmm. and and fought off a lot of uh, other outside interest of people Utah, that were Nebraska, trying to get him. Wisconsin I believe Wisconsin. was hard after him uh, as well as maybe even Minnesota mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure how involved they were but uh he in a lot of ways I think is similar to Jordan Stone in that he is a little bit offensively unrefined he's going to be a project but I mean what a framework to work with with that size and based on video, looks to have a decent amount of athletic ability. Now it's just up to one of the best big man coaches around to really turn the kid into a star. I mean, it's it's a fair point. You, I don't know if there's a coach, at least within what has been the mid-major level, but maybe in all of college basketball, I would want training big men more than Stu Morrill at this point. And, I mean, I ran into another – We I was happened to be playing a game of pickup ball uh, – in the hyper one day when Shanks was here before he was here on a recruiting visit and they were running him through some of his paces up there. He looks good and he's a big guy. And obviously the number one thing that we've been saying for a long time, the thing that will make him better and great within Stu's system is experience. We should be seeing five years out of him. So I'm stoked. Yeah. Well, and also you got to keep in mind the future for him is looking pretty bright. I mean, he say he red shirts this year, but next year things open up quite a bit because Jared Shaw is going to be graduating. Sean Harris is going to be graduating. Those two big holes that are going to need to be filled down low, whether it's in a starting role or as a you know guy off the bench that's being looked upon for big minutes. So I think I think that's exciting. Moving uh staying down low, I guess we've got a big man from Albuquerque, New Mexico, from Breaking Bad territory, James Crosdell. Now this is a guy that that's a Breaking Bad name right there. Well, it, it is. <laughs> yeah, you hear it that? is. <laughs> We should just call him. Uh, we'll just call him Heisenberg. For, I and, think that's awesome. Until he starts cooking. Well, when he starts cooking up baskets in the paint, he will be Heisenberg. <laughs> look at that kid. No, no, no kid already. Walk already. We're, we're nicknaming him. Let's do it. But, I mean, you look at it. His senior year of high school: ten point seven points per game, thirteen point nine rebounds, four point one blocks, three point one assists, and two point five steals per game. This is kind of a, a do it all kid. That right is now. all around production. And six foot seven to, and, to go with and, it all. And you never know with the injury situation to Ben Clifford, if he's good in practice, Stu always says that's the parameter for playing time, he could actually break in. Yeah, Plus, you never know. I mean, it, it, his bio on the website says that he will redshirt this season before going on a mission. Yeah, there you go. So, so you shouldn't expect to see him, but you know. You never know. Things Maybe, happen. Look, we, we've seen guys that were one-time walk-ons come in and succeed eventually. Look at Matt Formasano. Eh. Look, I'll tell you this much. Matt Formasano has more career game-winning baskets than J.C. Carroll. Wow. That's yeah. a stat you don't it, hear every it, day. It's that, that one against UC Santa Barbara. He had that tip in to win it. That was a great game. Yeah. Ugh. But, no, I, I think it's great to be able to look at a potential walk-on coming in, making some noise. And even if we don't see him for three years and he comes back, 
We'll have the Heisenberg name waiting for I'll, him. I'll tell you this much. I'll tell you this much. Just to have that kind of rebounding can make a difference. Because you look back to a few years ago, Brady Jardine gave a lot of credit for what made him a good rebounder to Ben Clifford. He said that every day in practice, this is when Ben Clifford was a red shirt, he said every day in practice, Ben Clifford is the toughest guy to rebound against because he is out there trying to outwork everybody. My challenge to James Crosdell, if he ever hears this, be freshman Ben Clifford. Go out there and play your best in practice. And make rebounds and, and I'll tell you what, for everyone else. If you play hard, good things are going to come your way. That's just how it works. Well, I mean, you look, there's been a long-standing tradition, not only within this program, but programs we've played against, of rebounding making a difference. You look... I mean, one of the one my favorite opponents we've ever had was when we were playing Paul Millsap at La Tech. The reason that La Tech was so successful through those years is because his ability to get the ball on the court when it was coming off the basket was insane. But then you look, I mean, I believe I believe Millsap led the nation in rebounding three straight years. It was crazy. And I believe he left after his junior year to go to the league. Yep. And then you look at the transition you can put into Utah State at this point, for a while, some of our leading rebounders have been guards. I mean, yeah. Or some, you know, you look the Jared Quayle, J.C. Carroll, J.C. Carroll is a great rebounder. Uh, Butterfield, Butterfield last year, holy cow! So, it's having someone six seven with that kind of a nose for the ball off the basket, if that's what we're reading out of his stats, could make a huge difference. I'm just going to give one quick side note: Paul Millsap versus Nate Harris. That series is three zero. Nate Harris. Just saying. But anyway, moving ahead. That's last your guy, Stu Moral coaching again, right there. Last guy on the roster, another another freshman walk on, Terrell Young, uh, from Judge Memorial High School. This is a guy that uh, I think you know the the coaching staff is looking at and seeing a moldable athlete. His numbers in high school not overly impressive, but this is one of those things where if a guy comes in and they see potential and they think they could turn him into a basketball player. You never know. And and as a walk-on, there's no risk for the coaching staff. You hope he comes in and has some basketball smarts and can make something of himself. But, you know, this is another one. Hopefully he can play tough on the scout team, really give these guys a solid run for their money and uh, make this make this program better. There is one player that we have not mentioned that is on the roster. Your boy Vico. Vico, there we go. Yeah. Uh, gosh, how did I overlook him? That's... Hey, you're the one with the computer in front of you right yeah, now. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I know. And it's failing me. I'm trying to talk and read at the same time. But no, this is uh Vico is an intriguing, intriguing guy to me because you look at the numbers he put up in high school and they are pretty filthy what he did. And and not in, you know, he didn't do this in Wyoming. Not that that's, you know, nothing to be scoffed at. But down in Las Vegas, they play some pretty good basketball. You look at the Alt State team that he was a part of a couple years back, and there are some big time names alongside him, and he's right on there in the first team. He averaged something like twenty six points a game in high school, uh, and you know he's back after a mission, and it's going to be interesting to see what he can do. He's a guy that seemed to fly under a lot of people's radars, and I think the mission aspect of things, you know, turned off a lot of big programs that might have otherwise had real interest in him. Here at USU, you know, we said. How many of those return missionary guys have not panned out? So I think in Vico's case, this is another guy to to keep a close eye on. And if, even if we don't get to see a lot of him this season, could be very interesting moving forward. Well, and I mean, we've talked about it for a while. We've got an awesome two guard set said right now at point guard. Roland's going to be all out after this season. I, I don't think there's any question that Davis is going to be retaining that starting role. If yeah. we can have someone who's going to be able to come in and not only pass well, but be a scoring threat off the bench. I'll tell you this. Much. Shape. If we can establish a pipeline to where we have uh, a, a new point guard coming in every other year, basically. So, you know, basically a senior and a sophomore and then, you know, or, or in this case, like, uh, well, yeah, this year will be senior, sophomore. And then the next year, junior, junior redshirt freshman. freshman. If we can keep that up, you know, because then we'll have. You know, Marcel Davis would be a senior in a couple of years. Vico would be a redshirt sophomore, have another point guard redshirting below that. If that is something we can set up and have that kind of continuity, that will make every team that much better. Well, and let's let's point it out once again. Another fact that I've been bringing up for since Davis really signed on as the, for the team, we have never seen a four-year point guard under Stu Morrill ever. 
We've seen a couple really, really good one- or two-year point guards, but we have never seen a four-year one. And if we can start seeing repeated four-year point guards, things are going to get nasty on, for the last few years of yes. what— well, I'm hoping for the last four decades worth of Stu Morrill's coaching career because I'm hoping he coaches till he's like 130 here. But that's just my vain hope. <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to have to sacrifice to keep him alive, but I'll kill it. <laughs> Thank you, Lance, for that impassioned expression <laughs> of feelings on the length of Stu Morrill's tenure at Utah State. I'm building an altar. Even though I, I share most of them with you. But look, there's a lot of people that had some stuff to share with us. So we're going to break into our next segment. It's the tweet sheet. Derek tweets in. He's a regular on the tweet sheet. How long till we beat the Stevon Williams, Brady Jardine moment against Nevada in terms of loudness? Oh, God. You're you're fighting a lot Never. of factors there. Yeah. The, the problem is, is I don't know if another coach is ever going to be stupid enough to tell the, st the student section that they cannot impact the game. Does anyone else uh, miss Mark Fox at Nevada? I, a I, lot. I, yeah, I every day. You know? Now, I, I'm... <laughs> I, I feel we could maybe be set up for something like this because we're going into a conference where there's a couple pretty good home court advantages. First and foremost, the pit, the pit at New Mexico. I think we might see, you know, a couple of these coaches come in with this attitude of, well, who are these new guys in the Mountain West? They don't know noise. You know, we faced worse. But if we can get that edge back to our crowd and that real just. That fire that the Spectrum has always been known for, and one of those coaches gets the idea that he wants to prove something, that these new guys in the league ain't going to try and push us around with their crowd. I think we could potentially see that kind of moment, especially given the factors that a lot of these games are going to be very tough and very close. Here's the thing. A lot of those coaches aren't as stupid as Mark Fox for not calling the timeout and letting the momentum continue to build. Like it did in that Nevada game, Mark Fox was too, too stubborn and just let it go, and it just blew up in his face. But that, that's exactly my point. Is I think some of these coaches might have that sense of stubbornness to to kind of... I play guess, through it? Yeah, yeah. They'll, they'll think, well, we can play through it. We're not going to let new guys push us around. Right. Not only that, but towards the end of this season, depending on the kind of season we're having, if we're watching a ranked Utah State team playing a ranked Mountain West Conference opponent on a home court... Has that ever have we ever watched Utah State play another ranked team at home? Has that ever happened? Not not in my years, no. No, I don't think I and I I might be able to say that it has never occurred watching two ranked teams, Utah State being one of the two playing on the court at Utah State. Lance, you're giving me goosebumps. Okay. That has never occurred in history. If we can get that going with the TV cameras watching and what the spectrum is going to be able to produce. And with the organization well, with what that the we're spectrum be should be able to produce what the spectrum is going to produce oh i like that attitude okay if we can have if we're playing 19th ranked utah state versus fifth ranked new mexico on the spectrum court or fifth ranked unlv or 10th or whatever it could be yeah i think you may see something burst this year not only because i think the students are going to bring it because those are the kind of games that are going to get the blue hairs up as well. I think we're going to watch the entire sure spectrum enough. jump to some new heights. Utah Stizzle tweets in, Jalen Moore, does he redshirt or do they get him playing this year? He plays. He plays. I think he plays this year. I, I'm not sure it's even it's a point a of debate among the coaching staff. Well, I know. But the thing is, Stu's going to have four wings playing on the roster. And if not Jalen, then who as the fourth wing? You, mean, know? you, you bring in JoJo McGladston, but... No, uh, not, like, not not no for the sense the, that he's not going to be good. But why not play more out of that? The, number? Ol the only scenario I could possibly see if Jalen Moore did redshirt is that Stu really thinks he needs a year to get acclimated and maybe mature physically. And if Vico Nomaia is absolutely killing it in camp and worthy of backup point guard duties and you can have Tanail Roland play some time at shooting guard. Yep. But given the size he brings and what that would do to the rest of the size, leaving Berger as kind of the lone tall wing out there, I, I just don't see more red shirting. Well, and I, I know there's a lot of people out there who want to say, oh, five years in the program would do him wonders. There's been people saying that we're going to be lucky to hold on to him for three. So mm -hmm. I'll take four if that's what we get. Don tweets in, how many NCAA tourney bids does the Mountain West receive this year? And does Utah State get one of those predictions from us? 
I'm saying four. They get four this year because it's still going to be a very good league. However, the selection committee, I, I feel they hold grudges. And while, yeah, the Mountain West struggled last year in the tournament, give some credit to the teams that beat them, you know? Like, that, that's what March Madness is all about. That's why it's madness is because you have upsets. You have good teams that get beat. Uh, and last year, the Mountain West fell victim to that. Well, and- I, I think pretty much all of them were deserving to be there. And I think we'll have a fair amount deserving to be there again this year. Now, the question of deserving can, I mean, there was a lot of people talking, especially after they all lost, the majority of them lost in that first round about the RPI padding that may or may not have occurred and how the statistics had gone into everything. And as you said, I think the selection committee is going to be a little biased going, well, last year we let five of them in and five upset or four upsets went into that first round. So... I think four is a safe bet. And Do we get one? I, you know what? I'm saying yes if we stay healthy. If if we can stay healthy, I especially with the way that this team, if we stay healthy and follow the established trend that Stu Morrill's teams have every year, which is peaking at the right times in January and February, we will be in the tournament. I, I'm going to add in one other qualifier. If we stay healthy and if the spectrum gets back to even like, 90% of the 2009 to 2011 caliber. It, it is the big X factor. Ogden Aggie, who makes a bigger impact, Medlin or Butterfield? Oh, gosh. Wow. Uh, that is a wonderful question. Maybe the toughest question I've ever <laughs> had to think of on this show. And I think it's a, a kind of a difficult Dead comparison cut. to make. That's <laughs> <laughs> You... The only thing I can compare it to, it's like either getting stabbed in the eye or hit over the head with a club. You know, <laughs> I think I think I'm going hit over the head because at least I'm, I still have two good eyes. Yeah, really. <laughs> yeah, but, we'll go with a mace then, a nice spiked mace. Okay, it, it's now it's you're it's, it's you're gonna get assassinated by Medlin, or you're just gonna get outworked, out hustled, and out bruised by Butterfield. And I can't tell you, I really can't. This is the thing. This is what I like is that they're in, in a lot of ways two different players. Yep, they have a lot of similarities, but they have a lot of differences. Uh, just man i i feel like having seen both of them at their best at least i think so butterfield was was hobbled last year but medlin at his best in the 2012 season was out of this freaking world what the the things he was doing during his sophomore season and so with that in mind as much as i love butterfield i mean the dude did amazing things last year too but I got to go Medlin. Well, and it's going to be interesting to see. I don't think Medlin succeeded the most when there was not as much pressure on him necessarily to be able to step in. I, I There was a lot of weight on his shoulders at that point, but Butterfield kind of thrived when he was the one who was shouldering the load for the team. Not to say that Medlin's not capable of that, but we also didn't, you know, the, with the injuries and everything it was a little weird. So as you, as you said, they're different players. If Butterfield comes out and starts shouldering the load and all of a sudden opens up Medlin from the far side to just be that assassin, things are going to get awesome. They are. They are. (laughs) Josh tweets in with our last question. Who do you think the starting five will be to start the season for Utah State? I'll go with my five. And we're talking USC starting the opening game of the season. So I will go Marcel Davis, Preston Medlin, Spencer Butterfield, Kyle Davis, Jared Shaw. I'm going to second that. I'm putting Harris in for our four. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't think anything else really gets mixed up there. I, uh, God, those wings are, the wing position is so hard to, I mean, I want to put Berger in there for the height and for what I, you know, for a glue player, but you can't take it away from Butterfield at this point. So, uh, first player off the bench for our sixth man, I think would be Berger off the bench. I agree. Um, but yeah, I think that's, that sets it. Thanks everyone for tweeting in your questions for our basketball preview. We always enjoy answering them and to all our good friends of the program. This has been a fun preview. We are jacked for Aggie basketball this year. Yes. And if I have one final thought to throw in for this, it, 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 it's simple. It, it, and it's on everybody. Everyone can do it. You know, if, if if the season ticket holders and us old people, if you're dissatisfied with the students, if you get loud, they'll respond to you. And students, if you get loud, you'll make the spectrum amazing like it always was. I just have one simple plea as my last words. 
make the spectrum the spectrum. It's, I don't know how much more I can top that. I mean, we've talked about it for weeks now about the individual being able to make the difference in these scenarios, get people to the game with you. You know, the, the glory years of the spectrum, and I, I almost hate referring to them as that because it doesn't need to be the case. And it wasn't that long ago, but it was packed with people who were passionate about coming in. And even if it was just making noise, they didn't understand what was going on on the court necessarily. It's easy enough to pick things up, get people to the game with you and make that personal stand to say, I'm going to be there for this team this year. The organization of what's able to happen in the spectrum is, once again, so much easier than what you can see in football. It's loud, it's organized, and I think it's only going to be able to get more, more and more that way as we watch this year progress. It is time for Aggie basketball. For the Front Row Show, I'm Jeff Browning. I'm Lance Rasmussen. And I'm Matt Sonnenberg. Go, Go Aggies! Aggies. Ready? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> <laughs> hey, Aggie fans. Thanks again for listening to this episode of the Front Row Show. Be sure to download all our archived episodes on iTunes. Follow us on Twitter at USU Front Row. Like our page on Facebook at facebook.com backslash USU Front Row. And subscribe to us on our new YouTube channel at youtube.com backslash USU Front Row.